So once you've prepared for a fire and written your prescription, your burn plan, um, got your objectives all together, uh, one thing that you're going to have to look at is, you know, what kind of fire equipment do you need um, to actually safely get a burn done? And, you know, this list can be kind of like overwhelming, right? There's, you could spend a lot of money on fire equipment. Um, we have ways that this equipment is already kind of out there for people to use, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So we'll talk about the different equipment, um, personal safety equipment, we'll talk about pumper units, and then a little bit about where and how to potentially access equipment that's out there. So when you're planning your burn, first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is kind of develop, a, develop an equipment checklist based on your burn plan. So this is any, anywhere from, you know, like how many radios do you need? How many pumpers, ATVs? So you basically wanna keep a list of everything that you're gonna need in order to safely burn. So just write out, you know, a piece of paper, like here's all the things that we're gonna need. You know, how many drip torches do we need? How many flappers? Uh, do we need a tow rope, first aid kit, extra fuel? Uh, all these different things are, are really important to have. Now, we're going to talk about firing methods. Of how do we actually start a fire? So we commonly use what we call drip torches. Um, these are very specifically uh, designed for prescribed fire and wildland fire operations. This, this unit right here is what we call the Panama drip torch. This is what we typically, this is what we almost exclusively use in our firing operations. They do cost about $270, um, but they are, they're worth their weight in gold. They have three different wand sizes, a 12 and 15 and 19 inch wand. We almost exclusively use a 19 inch wand. And, and the reason why is because we don't want people bending over as they're putting fire on the ground. And so we want them standing up straight. And we also want to put fire really close to the ground, especially when we're laying in our, our black line, our downwind line. A couple of things to know about these torches is that you want to make sure you carry extra gaskets. So on the right there, you can see where that filler cap is. In that filler cap, there's a little gasket on there. And sometimes um, if fuel pressure builds up inside of there, it'll, it can only escape in the least least resistant area, and that is typically that gasket. So what happens over time is it displays and leaks out there, and so you want to make sure you carry some extra gaskets in there. Also, you want to make sure you not overfill these drip torches. So you want to fill it about three quarters full. And the reason why we don't want to overfill them is because if you overfill them, what happens is that these things turn into Roman candles. And they'll actually, the pressure inside will actually cause them to keep spitting. So they'll actually throw fire out into the air and, you know, sometimes five, 10 feet away from you know, if, they're, if they're full. So we always want to make sure we empty the fuel during storage, obviously, so pressure doesn't build up inside of them. If you do store them for a short amount of time, make sure you crack either the fuel control valve or the air breather to allow pressure to dissipate. Again, they're not going to explode if they're um, if the pressure builds up in there. They'll just leak out where that gasket is, and you'll have to put a new gasket on there. And those gaskets are like seven dollars a piece. So think about that. Uh, if you look on the right side, this diagram here, uh, we'll go over a little bit. So this is the applicator wick. It's a um, like an asbestos pad where fire uh, the drip torch fuel comes down this wand and hits this pad and this pad is what's actually on fire and catches the fuel inside the torch on fire and as it lays down. The really cool thing about the Panama torch is that the way this uh, applicator wick and pad is designed, it actually helps with some of the wind resistance. So uh, the fire doesn't get blown out by the wind. And then there's a blowback loop. This is a protection so fire doesn't travel down the down the, the wand and get into the tank, cause any problems. There's a fuel control valve right here. Um, and this basically controls the, how much fuel is actually getting dripped out. With Panama drip torches, you can, you can open it all the way up and 
put down a bunch of fuel or you could dial it back so it's just barely trickling out. Um, and then with that, uh, you always wanna turn the air breather on first. So just crack the air breather, that helps that fuel get out. So first thing you do is you crack that air breather and then you adjust your fuel control uh, to make sure that, that comes out. And obviously there's uh, the fuel tank and the handle there um, for that purpose of uh, safely carrying around that fuel. So on the opposite end of the spectrum, there's what they call forestry drip torches. Now, these are less expensive. They're about 150 bucks. So people look at them like, oh, well, I'm gonna go kind of the cheaper route. But I'm telling you, if you, if you buy one yourself, don't skimp and get, that, get the Panama and not this one. And I'll tell you why. So first major reason is that the wand size, 12 inches is, is not long enough to make sure we reach the ground right where we need it. Um, basically, it's about applying the fuel to the ground where we need it to be applied to. And these torches, the 12 inch wand is one strike against it. The second strike against the Panama drip torches is you see where the applicator wick is. So what happens is that that wick is where the fire, so that fuel comes out the wand and then hits that wick and, and starts to fire. So when we're burning in Nebraska and the Great Plains, we typically have wind and lots of wind. We're very famous for it. So what happens is that as you're holding that drip torch on the ground, a gust of wind comes by and the, it's blowing the fuel away from your wick. And it basically just snuffs out your wand or uh, snuffs out your torch. And so you have to continually relight the thing. And it's just a pain. So uh, again, these are good for you know other situations in timber, they work pretty well. Um, but in our grassland scenario, we don't, um, they don't work as well. The third strike against the forestry drip torch is that there's really no fine tuning of the fuel. And so the no fine tuning of the fuel. So basically like there's one, there's one speed and that's full blast. So you're gonna be going through more fuel with these than you would be if you had a Panama. The convenient thing about this is the wand does store inside for easier transport, um, but the other benefits um, or negatives of it don't outweigh it. So same thing with the other one, don't overfill it. Same reasons, carry extra gaskets for the same reasons, uh, empty the empty during storage for the same reasons as well. With this one, uh, the, since there is no fine tuning, uh, crack the air breather and then light it. And how you, how you light these drip torches is that you, you drop a little bit of fuel onto the ground and then you light that fuel on the ground and then drop the drip torch into it to light that wick. Now, many people have tried using these propane weed burners uh, to avoid the cost of buying a drip torch. Um, it's worked for some people, but you know, these things don't have very, they're not easily fine tuned uh, for, for their purpose. They're very hard to start initially, um, and they're also heavy and not very mobile. And fuel can be expensive. You, know, you can go through a lot of fuel uh, and you have to actually take it somewhere to get it refilled. Whereas if you're using the other drip torches, um, you know, you're just using a combination of uh, diesel fuel and gas, typically at 80% diesel, 20% gas, or if it's cooler, if it's uh, colder out, you want to use 70% diesel and 30% gas. So with firing devices, a very common theme here is just treat it like it's a loaded gun, right? Keep the loop pointed away from you, open your uh, air fuel valves. And then, like I said, dripping that fuel on the ground and then lighting it and then place the wick in the flame. And then basically to, to stop ignition, um, there's two ways you can do it with these Panamas. You can either blow it out, which you gotta be very careful of because if you blow it out, let's say that, that pad, that applicator that's right here, if you have that parallel to your face and you blow on it, there's gonna be fuel on there and it's gonna splatter back. So if you're gonna blow it out, you wanna make sure you lean that forward and blow outward. And so the fuel blows out away from you. But the most, the best way to do it is to have a, a thick gloves and just snuff it out that way. 
or the third option is to just set the set the drip torch down and that wick will burn itself out of fuel. So those are three ways to put it out that we normally use. And again, there's that fuel mixture that we use diesel to unleaded. 80 to 20 is when uh, during like really warm time of the year. And then 70, 30 is when it's a little bit cooler, like early springtime, like currently. Treat it like a, treat it like a uh, loaded gun. Always be aware of your surroundings. Carry upright when you're not firing. Don't take a torch outside of the burn unit. I've seen this happen a couple times where they're carrying a torch. They walk outside of the unit and they're dropping fire as they're going along. So it's important to extinguish that flame when you stop firing for that reason, because people have a tendency to kind of wander away. When you're refilling these things, refill away from the fire line. You know, don't be anywhere near uh, fire just because of fumes from the gas and diesel and stuff like that potentially can catch. All fuel cans should be labeled. Um, many times we'll just use regular gas cans and write on there uh, drip torch fuel. Some people actually use old herbicide uh, containers and uh, fill it that way. Again, reiterate, reiterate not to overfill drip torches. And then obviously if you have a holder for these drip torches on your ATV or truck, uh, use them on there. Otherwise they kind of bounce around and, and get messed up. So now that we got the firing tools, you know, how we actually start the fire, let's, you know, talk a little bit about what other equipment that we're going to be using on a, on a prescribed burn. A couple of the really basic stuff that we always have on hand are raking tools. Uh, the most common is just a simple rake. Obviously, we don't want to be using plastic rakes. So any kind of a metal rake, um, it works out fine. And we use this, we can use this to rake away vegetation from the fire break overturn, cow pies, stuff like that. And then we also use uh, suppression tools of like what we call a flapper or a swatter. Um, it's a really bad term for the tool because we do neither flap or swat with them. They should actually be renamed a smotherer. And what essentially these things are, are basically a mud flap on a, on a wood handle. And we're using it to snuff out, starve the, the fire of oxygen. Now, of course, we're not putting this on big flames. This is stuff that's just kind of like lightly burning on the edge of a, of a fire. And I believe this next video will, it'll show you the wrong way how to use a flapper and then it'll show you the right, correct way to use a flapper. So here's the wrong way, right? We're increasing oxygen. We're not really doing anything. We're throwing fuel around. And now here's gonna be the correct way to use it. So you're gonna put it right on the edge of that fire and just slowly kind of starve it of oxygen. See how it snuffs it out. So these are pretty common on, on most of our burns. Another common instrument that we typically wanna make sure we have on hand is a chainsaw. This is a must if you're burning near woodlands. Make sure you know how to operate it and have all the different um, items you need to safely burn, including mixed fuel and a maintenance kit on hand. There's many times where there's a tree that catches on fire right on the line. And instead of trying to put it out, which is sometimes nearly impossible, it's best just to cut the tree down and, and eliminate the problem while we're there. So backpack blowers, I talked about this earlier. Backpack blowers are really useful, as you can see. Uh, I got Jake here, he's using a backpack blower to put out a flank fire. And then we have a gentleman right behind him that's kind of following up to make sure that nothing kind of flares back up. These stains are really useful to help put out kind of small spot fires. They save you a bunch of water. Um, just make sure you have mixed fuel uh, with you to operate these and uh, know how to operate them. Obviously these aren't gonna put out like, you know, big head fires and stuff like that, but they're really good for backing fires and also for uh, flank fires. Another thing to consider too is, is how to use these things. You very well potentially could, uh, if you use it wrong, you could actually blow embers, you know, into susceptible fuel and cause another fire. So 
it takes a little bit of time to figure out how these you know, where these work out really well. Um, but they work and it doesn't have to be a backpack blower. You could use your handheld ones as well. So radios are an absolute must uh, on our prescribed fires. I make sure that almost uh, everybody on them has a radio. And there's a lot of different options that you can use for radios. Most of them are these just two-way radios. They're like $50 for a two-pack of them. They're the Midland two-way radios. They got multiple channels to use from. Uh, we use these Bofums. They're programmable radios. They cost about 70 bucks each. Um, and then, they, then some radios, they go all the way up to like, they cost like $3,000, which, you know, like wildland firefighters use out west. We typically don't use those. Another big thing, it's kind of a pet peeve of mine, is when people don't use radio harnesses, chest harnesses. Um, they're, they're really good because they keep them really close to where you need them to talk into and position it. Make sure your hand is not covering the mic that you're talking into so it sounds muffled. The other thing is, is when you're using these radios, when you're using them, you press down on the button and then talk. You don't talk and press the button at the same time because typically your initial communication gets cut off. So you press down the button for a quarter second and then you talk. And then when you talk, you know, just try to be, you know, talk like a normal human being. But then there's also, you know, like when you call somebody like, you know, hey, Ryan, this is Gerald, got a copy. And then once, you know, Gerald may be busy doing something. So you wait for them to call back and say, yep, go ahead. This is Gerald. Um, and then, then that person can communicate what they need to talk to him about. And then once that task is maybe done, like say they were sending somebody over to an ignition point, you know, come back like, hey, hey, Ryan, I sent that person to, um, to point C. And you're like, okay, copy that. Thank you. But just talk like a normal human being. You don't need to get like any kind of specific lingo or jargon. And every, every burn crew uses different radio, uh, uses the radio differently. And you'll get used to the people that, are your, that you're working with. Another really handy tool to have on hand is what we call the Kestrel weather meter. Um, this, this Kestrel is a very specific brand but there's also other weather meters out there. I'm not sponsored by Kestrel, but there are other weather meters out there. Um, and they basically record temperature, humidity, uh, wind speed, wind gusts. Uh, they do need to be calibrated every few years. Um, and they run, I think they run about 150 bucks for like the basic model um, for these. Some other personal protective equipment that, uh, that you'd wanna consider having, uh, goggles. Goggles are a must. Uh, when you get into that smoke, uh, that smoke really bothers your eyes. And for some people, it like, basically is intolerable. So having a good pair of goggles is pretty critical. The one thing I'll say about goggles is you'll want to buy a pair that doesn't have the vents in them if you're gonna be on the fire line eating smoke all day. So if you go online to forestry suppliers and you order like the wild and fire goggles, mo most of those have vents because um, they're not gonna be, you know, they're not in thick smoke a lot of the time. But there are several goggles out there that are not vented um, that really help protect your eyes from smoke. And I suggest buying those. Um, and, I think one, my favorite are the Bulls, B-O-L-L-E, fire goggles. I really like those. They really keep the, keep the smoke out. At least a minimum of like sunglasses. If, if smoke doesn't bother you, you can wear sunglasses. Another, um, another good option on a fire line from a smoke aspect is either like a neck shroud or even a mask. Um, N95 masks, uh, everybody has them now from COVID. So they're really good to use on the fire line from a smoke standpoint. If smoke doesn't bother you terrible, you can just use a, just a basic neck shroud or a bandana around your mouth to, to keep those out. 
at the very basic level of protection on a person, we want to make sure you have long sleeve shirts on, uh, cotton pants or all natural pants, uh, or Nomex if available. We, you know, we don't require Nomex from landowners when we burn, um, just cotton, non-synthetic materials are fine. And then of course, a good pair of leather gloves and boots just to protect you from the, the heat and the flames. Uh, you know, if you wear any kind of most, a lot of boots and shoes have synthetic materials in them and your feet are probably the most common thing that gets, gets heat on it or flames near it. So a good pair of leather boots um, is always key. So these guys are pretty well good fire ready. You know, I would suggest maybe uh, this gentleman on the left, you know, maybe put on a long sleeve shirt, but then again, I'm not gonna, you know, if he wants to burn his arms, you know, embers touching him, you know, he'll learn his lesson pretty fast, but, you know, blue jeans, t-shirt, hats, sunglasses, is good for our, good for burning. There's some other equipment items that we typically will use, uh, utilize. We use prescribed fire head signs. Uh, these signs are really good to put on roads to indicate that fire is happening. Uh, it, it helps protect traffic, but then the other thing is, is that every time a fire happens, you always get the looky loose from miles away that's come see what's happening. So when, when they get close by and they don't necessarily see people working the fire, they see these prescribed fire head signs and know that things are under control. A pair of fencing pliers, uh, in case you know you got to bust through a fence, a good pair of fencing pliers or to create access. A toe strap, uh, a winch, uh, something just in case something gets stuck. If you've got access to a tractor with a disc and you're in a, like around a cropland situation, it's always good to have something like that. It's also really important to have replacement parts for your pumper units or drip torches. You know, have extra gaskets, have extra pull cords, um, extra air filters, extra um, spark plugs, anything that can kind of go bad normally will on a fire. So try to have some of those items that, um, that if it does break down and you can fix it, you can fix it on site. So one of the biggest things uh, that you'll need on a prescribed fire is, is some kind of pumper unit to put out fire, whether we're putting in a wet line or putting out a spot fire, we need to have something that's going to, to put this out. Now there's a bunch of pre-made um, and homemade options that you can use on a prescribed fire. Uh, we have custom built units uh, that we have in all of our trailers, but you could go online there's a lot of vendors out there that create these pumper units uh, designed for landowners and agencies and stuff like that. You know, they could range anywhere from, you know, $100 all the way up to six, seven, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 sometimes, and even more than that. We'll talk about different types. You should have enough equipment to safely burn um, and deal with any escapes properly. It's pretty important. You want to, you know, Going out there with just your little spot sprayer on the back of your ATV is, is not enough. So this is a homemade unit that was put together. Again, you know, um, they got a tank in there and they got a pump and they got a hose. Um, you could build these in your shop. Pretty easy to do once you kind of figure out how basic pumps operate. Many times the volunteer fire departments will actually come out and help us. They have these big uh, grass rigs. Um, these are like probably the most expensive uh, units. These pumpers typically cost anywhere from 15 to $20,000, not including the truck um, option. The slip on units that we utilize are, uh, are these, uh, they're 200 gallon tanks. Uh, they got a five and a half horsepower motor. They've got three quarter inch hose, 150 foot, and then also with adjustable nozzles on them. So we can actually adjust them from, you know, five gallons per minute all the way up to dump 30 gallons per minute through these pumps. Um, so the, these, these pumps are just as good as the, the bigger fire grass rig pumps and are able to put out spot fires and put down wet lines and stuff. 
and we'll talk about these are the units that we actually use in our in our uh, burn trailers. I've also seen people use like three point uh, hitch sprayers like this. You know, they got on the back of a tractor, use it for spot spraying. They got a wand. Um, these are very good and useful for those if you got them laying around the farmstead. ATV sprayers, uh, you know, most every farm operation has an ATV with one of these sprayers on them. What I'll say about these sprayers is that they have very limited usefulness on a fire. Um, they're very good for putting out like stuff that's smoldering along the line or, you know, small little spot fires. But, you know, if there was any kind of significant incident uh, on a fire, these things become very irrelevant really fast. And you're going to need something with a little more oomph, like this pumper that's in the back of this truck um, that can create and put down more water. But they're still very useful for patrolling and, and small little spot fires. Now, we, um, if you have a UTV, a UTV allows, oh, actually, I'm going to go back to this. So on these um, ATV sprayers, you can actually upgrade these pumps from like, I think like the minimum is like a 1.7 gallon per minute, which they typically come with. You can actually upgrade them to about like uh, pumps that are like five and a half gallons per minute. So they actually do put down more water. So if you have one of these, go to the farm store and buy the upgraded pump. You know, it's gonna cost you more money, but they're gonna be more effective on the burn. The 1.7 or 1.9 gallon per minute pumps are, are practically worthless on a burn. Now, if you have a UTV, this allows an opportunity for you to upgrade and get larger pumper units into the back of them that are you know, more designed and geared toward use on prescribed fire and can put out. This one actually has a um, uh, low volume, high pressure system on them. And we're starting to convert most of our pumper units to, to these. And it, basically what these are, are units that act almost like a, um, pressure washer, right? So they're putting out not a ton of water, but they're doing it at a very high pressure. So you're able to uh, be more effective with your water. Like this unit here, I think this unit is around $6,500 is custom made um, unit. There is a lot of different available options for UTVs now um, that range anywhere from 3,500, you know, all the way up to the seven or eight thousand dollar range that will fit into the back of uh, UTVs. Also, when we're using these water systems, many times we run out of you know filling up once is, isn't just an option. So many times we're going to need more water than these pumps can hold, and so you're going to need to gather um, you know, water tenders. And typically we use these, you know, 1,000 or 1,500 gallon egg water tenders that they use for, you know, fertilizer or herbicide application during the, you know, planting. And you can get these from the egg co-op um, or you can buy one. A lot of times, you know, people have old tanks sitting around, you can throw a pump on and, and fill out of. These are really handy. You can hook them up to the truck and tr tractor, or drag them around wherever you need them. Another option, you know, uh, this one's just old fire equipment. I think this is like a two or 3,000 gallon tank on the back of it. It's really cool. They built this custom job where this arm actually swings out over the top of the truck. And you can actually fill your pump from it. So you can get really creative, you know, depending on how much fire you're doing about, you know, where, uh, what your water tender is to create these custom units. Now, many times, uh, we, we avoid this, this situation if at all possible, but sometimes, you know, you need access to water where you can get it. In this case, we can use a transfer pump uh, with hose on it. Uh, the thing to be concerned about if you use a trash pump, again, we want, typically we want clean water because clean water doesn't clog up our, our uh, systems in our pumper units and our strainers. If you pump out of a pond like this or say a creek, Sometimes you'll get like debris and moss and vegetation in there. So you gotta actually be careful with your pumper units to not uh, 
to not get them clogged. And if they do get clogged, you got to take off the strainer, unclog it, and refill it. But these are a good option if you need, you know, access to water in areas where maybe you don't have access to water. A couple different things about pumpers. Don't get caught with the sprayer too small for the job. And that, that basically uh, is directly related back to uh, those ATV spot sprayers. Those typically, again, they have their, they have their, if, you know, usefulness, but in a lot of situations where we're we need bigger pumpers, they're not adequate enough. Make sure that you continually fill your water tank. Uh, if you get below a quarter full, think about you know refilling before you get empty. Typically, you don't want to be empty. Um, you know, the scenario of like if you're putting out a spot fire, obviously you're going to run out of run it all out of water until you um, to go refill. But if you're just putting down wet line. You always want to make sure that you, you know, start monitoring your water level. And if it starts getting low, you need to either swap out with another engine or you need to, um, you know, stop ignition and go refill. And of course, you're going to want to, you know, talk to your burn boss, crew boss about filling for all that. And again, you always, you're always going to use more water than you think, but you also want to have more water than you think. So, you know, I would rather have the water on hand and not need it and dump it on the ground than need it and not have it. Very obvious. So <laughs> for a very basic, I've seen people actually do pretty big burns to adjust these things, but these backpack sprayers uh, have some effectiveness, uh, especially if you don't have vehicle access, you can use these bladder bags. The thing that remind these things leak, so you're going to get wet on your back, but it also each gallon of water weighs eight pounds, I think. Uh, I think that's right. So you're gonna be carrying 40 pounds of water on your back. So think about that if you're gonna be using these things, but they do work pretty well. So the thing about equipment is before the burn actually happens, before a match is ever put on the ground, make sure that your pumpers are working. Fire them up, spray water out. Make sure that they're working. Check your wiring on your ATV, UTVs. Make sure that they're hooked up to the batteries correctly. Make sure you have gas in them. Um, all those things. Make sure you know how to use the equipment. If you're unfamiliar on how they operate, um, have somebody show you and play around with it. And make sure you have all the burn equipment that you need that's listed in your plan. If you, if you called for three pumper units and you only have two, you'd be out of prescription and therefore should not probably burn. Now, some things to be on the lookout is damaged equipment. So here you can see that there was a break or uh, a connection that they put together here. Well, if you're dragging this hose in down a slope or something like that, um, this could easily come apart and then you have a big problem. So, uh, General maintenance, you know, at the end of the year, I would just probably replace this hose or replace it properly or, you know, fix it properly uh, just to prevent that damage from causing any problems on the actual fire. Same thing is when you're dragging this hose out on these pumper units, be very careful if you're putting out something because they're, they're fire resistant, but they will, um, fire can damage them. So, a lot of times if you're dragging hose out, putting spot fires out or, or doing something, just watch where that hose is at all times so it doesn't get in actual flames or any place that's smoking. Annual maintenance is really important uh, to do to changing the oil, making sure the pumpers are drained properly antifreezed. This pump was not properly drained and antifreezed and actually cracked uh, when we were, on a, uh, we were using it. We actually stuck a screw in it and put flex seal tape over it and it actually got us through. Um, but I highly recommend not using that option if you can. So properly winterizing your, your pumper units um, and using maintenance on them, changing spark plugs, the oil, uh, getting the air filter cleaned out, all those different things. And then of course, proper winterization. So in the springtime here in Nebraska, a lot of times we, it's really nice during the day, but then it'll freeze at night. 
And so it's really important to drain all the water out and run RV antifreeze through them um, or use a, use a uh, um, compressor, air compressor and blow out all the water in these. So there's no pressure in the buildup and cause like a split like that. Also just, you know, on the fire line, um, just be very careful with your equipment. This uh, flapper here on the left side was on the back of a UTV going through a gate that was obviously narrower than the width of the flapper. So that busted. On the right hand side, um, they were going to fill up the drip torch, uh, drip torches and uh, pumpers. And they set, once they were done, they set these gas cans in front of a truck and the person in the truck did not know they were there and ran over them. So there's a lot of different equipment. So one of the biggest barriers to getting fire on the ground is the lack of access to the equipment. And so we've actually helped solve some of those problems, but we, we don't have near enough equipment to go around. But one of the ways that you could get equipment is join an existing prescribed burn association that actually has equipment. Uh, if there's no association in your area, you could always form a new group, uh, a new burn association to share those resources uh, together. So here are our burn associations here in Nebraska. There's a couple on here that uh, are not functioning very well or not functioning at all currently. I need to update this map. Um, but these are our burn associations across the state um, that are kind of working on gathering equipment. And actually, uh, if you have a burn association through us with Pheasants Forever, we actually provide a trailer full of equipment. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, and then also resources to, to kind of help get things going. So this is what we have here in Nebraska as far as our what we call mobile prescribed burn unit trailers. These are just uh, five foot by 10 foot trailers uh, or six by 10 trailers um, that have the equipment stored inside of them. Kind of, and we give you know at least one, some of our burn associations actually have two of these units. <clears throat> so they actually include uh, they include two of these 200 gallon pumper units. They have adjustable nozzles on them. They have drafting capabilities on them. Uh, they got 150 foot of hose, uh, really nice pumper units. Uh, again, these cost, they have custom, custom skids. So you can actually, they got wheels on them so you can drag them around. And typically three to four people can easily lift these into the back of a truck and strap them down. We also have uh, flappers, we got spare tire here, Jack. We also have flappers in there and rakes, two of the most common hand tools that we use on the fire line. Then we also have six drip torches that come with each burn unit, uh, Panama drip torches. We also have fuel cans in there. Uh, we also provide prescribed fire ahead signs to utilize, We've got backpack sprayers in them. Uh, we also have gloves, we've got radios, we've got Nomex uh, shirts and jackets for people to kind of wear over their own clothing. Um, most of the time, if they, you know, they, a lot of people just wear them because, you know, get dirty and just get this stuff dirty instead of their regular clothes. Um, we've got goggles in there, gloves, um, got neck shrouds in there. So kind of basically everything kind of in this unit, we custom build all the shelving units and everything in here. But there's also other places if you want to gather your own equipment on your own time. Sometimes you can, you know, uh, local fire departments are getting, they want to upgrade their grass rig. So they're going to sell their old grass rig so you can get an old grass rig from them. Uh, forestry suppliers or other catalogs or other suppliers, you can buy pumps from them or goggles and fire clothing and stuff like that. Uh, Supply Cash is another good organization to buy stuff from. 
A lot of state agencies and nonprofits also have equipment available for uh, people to use. So basically that just takes reaching out to, to your local agencies, local biologists and fire agencies to see if they have equipment on hand. And then also you can look at like auctions, uh, Facebook marketplace. I actually found this pumper on Facebook marketplace. Uh, it came off of a little fire rig. Um, you know, I think I got it for under 1500 bucks. You know, I had to rehab it a little bit, but there's opportunities to find equipment out there. Um, so it takes a little searching, but many times you can get it. Uh, here's some of the list of uh, areas in Nebraska you can find some equipment. 